Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. We're certainly glad that you're here. Uh, our friend from St. John. Okay. Try that again. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to worship tonight. Certainly glad you're here, especially inviting our, our invited guests from St. John. We'll be, we'll be with you tomorrow night at your church at 7 o'clock for Good Friday service. And um, we did not have the time of your Easter Sunday service, but St. John's meets at 10 15, right? As well on Easter Sunday morning. When you came in, you should have picked up a communion cup. We're still on the prepackaged things at the moment. And so if you did not pick up a prepackaged uh, communion wafer cup, please do go get one during the opening hymn. Okay? And it also tells instructions on how to open them if you haven't had enough experience opening those yet. Uh, they could get a little tricky from time to time. But again, we're welcome. Glad you're here tonight. Let us uh, prepare to worship God by singing of our song of preparation. to receive the gift of the Lord. Lord, we are ready. Let us pray. Lord, we enter worship this evening, having experienced the joy of Palm Sunday, in which Jesus led the parade into Jerusalem. But this night is different. On this night, Jesus demonstrates the meaning of discipleship. Keep our hearts and our spirits open, O oh Lord, so that we may learn to be true disciples. For oh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now join together in singing our opening hymn, and those who are able, please rise.
us join together in the prayer of confession. It would have been so easy to skip out of this worship service, O oh Lord. Our lives are so filled with activities and demands, yet we are here, drawn by your Spirit, to hear your words for us. We are called to learn the meaning of commitment and discipleship from the Master. Forgive us when we are tempted to pull away from this opportunity. Fill our hearts with your healing love. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus offers you peace and hope. You have been washed clean of your sins. Know that God's love has surrounded you with its healing power. Thanks be to God. chapter of Exodus, the first 14 verses. Trying to convince the Pharaoh to let the Israelites leave Egypt and slavery behind, God has assailed the Egyptians with nine plagues. But so far, the Egyptian ruler has refused to let them depart and to acknowledge the supremacy of Israel's God. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. That should be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire, with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And our epistle lessons from 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, verses 23 to 26. And in instructing the Christians at Corinth on proper behavior at the Lord's Supper, Paul tells us the earliest words we have for consecrating the bread and the wine. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And our gospel lessons from the 13th chapter of John. As the time when Jesus will end his earthly life approaches, he and his disciples share a meal together. He demonstrates the importance of servanthood in the Christian way of life. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put on, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are, mas nor, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Thank you. Let us now be the church in prayer. Gracious God, as those who strive to follow Jesus in our living and to trust your power in our dying, we gather to reflect upon the life that ended on a cross. We recognize in ourselves the strengths and weaknesses of Jesus' disciples. Although they loved him, they disappointed and failed him. And yet, gathering with these imperfect friends at this last meal, Jesus washed their feet in service and then extended the bread and cup to each. Jesus called them to love one another and invited them to share in his very life and in his acceptance of the rough road ahead. We are humbled, honored, and inspired by the deep love Christ extended to the world. 
And we take seriously the calling to be the body of Christ today. Lord, forgive us when we disappoint and fail you. And guide us back to a place of trust and faithful living. Grant us the vision to see the world as you see it, with love and compassion for each creature and all of your creation. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's Table on this Monday, Thursday evening. This is a special place and a special time. It is hopefully a time when we as the family of Christ draw closer to one another and closer to God. Recently in an unexpected place, I ran across an, an example of the closeness that can develop around the table. Football fans will remember that in the 2018 Super Bowl, the Philadelphia Eagles pulled off a stunning win over the New England Patriots, 41-33 in Super Bowl 52. According to writer and, and, and inspirational speaker Rick Brown, some of that success developed around the table. Every night, every Thursday night, during the 2007-2018 football season, the members of the defensive unit of the Eagles got together for a meal. <coughs> The purpose of this meal was not to ensure that the players were eating well, but to bond them together as a team. One thing served up at the meal was a no phones policy. There were times the phones were placed in the pile. Other times the players were allowed to keep their phones, but the first one to pick up theirs had to pay a fine. Which practice that around the church, too. <laughs> Malcolm Jenkins saw how the policy worked when he was with the New Orleans Saints, and when he came to Philadelphia, he wanted to implement it there too. So throughout the season, the team gelled. Practice helped. Coaching made them better at their positions, but it was what happened around a table, according to Rick Brown, that forged a winning team. You and I are not members of a professional football team, but we may confront many challenges of our own. And I believe that time spent before the Lord's table can help us prepare us spiritually and emotionally for those challenges as we eat the sacred bread and drink from the sacred cup. St. Paul gives us the earliest description that we have of this sacred feast. Listen carefully as I again read his words that Susan just read. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In this lesson, St. Paul gives us three reasons for receiving the Lord's Supper. The first is to help us remember Christ and all he means to us. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, it is my body, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. I read in USA Today years ago that every second people take, every second, people take 591 photographs. That's 51.1 million photos every day. We take 3 billion photographs just during the November, December holiday season, according to this article. That's a lot of photos. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, so that would be a very big book, wouldn't it? Actually, because I read this in a 1993 USA Today, 
That means that this is probably an enormous undercount of the total number of pictures taken. Think what a difference digital cameras have made. Remember those bulky cameras you had to carry and the film you had to buy? And remember taking the film to the camera store or drug store and they have the film developed? Well, now you can accomplish all that with your cell phone. So that anytime, anywhere, you can pull out your phone and show off thousands of pictures of your grandchildren. <laughs> right? <laughs> but why do we take all those pictures? It is to help us remember special occasions and special people important in our lives. Remembering is a very important part of life. Stories serve the same purpose. Reverend Patricia Gillespie reminds us of the story of a little Sadako dying of leukemia from the radiation at Hiroshima. How she hoped that if she folded a thousand paper cranes, the gods would hear her prayer. We remember Sadako, and children still today fold paper cranes and pay for, pray for peace. Reverend Gillespie says that when her daughter Miranda was small, she sat in church and folded dollar bills into paper cranes for the offering. The money became an offering and a prayer for peace. We remember and hope that things will change like crumpled dollar bills into lovely cranes. Remembering is very important. Pastor Michael Iaconelli was serving Holy Communion at the home of a friend who was suffering from cancer. And the man's children and grandchildren came to share in a moment. And in the midst of serving the bread and the wine, 11-year-old Joshua suddenly asked, Sir, how can you hear God speak to you? Pastor Giaconelli explained about listening carefully for God's voice. The trouble with children, Giaconelli writes, is they believe you. Joshua responded immediately to this advice by closing his eyes and concentrating every ounce of energy on listening for God. A few seconds later, his eyes popped open, and with great excitement, he announced that God had spoken to him. And what did God say, the adults asked? In a voice tinged with all Joshua said, he said, don't forget me. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Do this so you won't forget me. That's the first reason that we're here tonight, to remember Christ and what he has done on our behalf. And remember what he has done, we are, as we remember what we have, he has done, we are drawn to a second reason that we're here this evening, to hear Christ's call to repentance. His broken body and shed blood remind us of his wondrous grace. Even though we are not all we should be, even though some of us have hearts full of regret over past deeds we have done or hurtful words we have spoken, by his grace, we are accepted just as we are. In an issue of the publication Life and Life, Dan Hummer tells about a 60-year-old man named Bill who he met when he was serving as chaplain at the VA Medical Center in Indianapolis. He recalls Bill's tears along with his request that Dan pray with him, but with little verbalization of any specific concern. One notable Sunday afternoon during his ward visitation and following those earlier seemingly insignificant encounters with Bill, a beautiful exchange transpired. When he stopped by Bill's room on that particular Sunday, he was carrying a small, compact communion set. Following some brief pleasantries, Bill asked, with his eyes focused on the communion set, Chaplain, what is it that's in that black box? And Dan explained to Bill what it contained and the significant meaning of communion. When he finished, Bill posed a question Dan says he will never forget. With some hesitation, yet deliberateness, Bill asked, do you think there's enough in there for me? Dan's heart was immediately stirred as he realized the impact of Bill's question. Can God forgive me, he was inquiring? Is it possible that I can experience the love and forgiveness of God in the light of my sinful past, he pondered? With genuine remorse, Bill shared a story of his shameful past. In return, Dan shared with Bill the reality of the gospel message. He explained that just as the younger son in Luke chapter 15 found forgiveness and acceptance, so he, Bill, could experience the same with God. Dan joyfully served Bill communion that very afternoon from the black box about which he raised these pointed questions. My friends, you and I are recipients of that same kind of grace. 
late President Lyndon B. Johnson had inscribed on the doormat of his ranch home in Texas these words, all the world is welcome here. That inscription could grace the communion tables of all the world's churches. All the world is welcome here. Remembrance, repentance, but one more reason that we're here this evening, preparation. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The third reason we're here is to prepare ourselves for Christ's coming. We have no idea when that will be. Some believe it is near. Others say, don't worry about it. It's in God's hands. Jesus said, no one knows when the climactic day will be. For us as individuals, it could be any time. For whenever we personally leave this earth to appear before the throne of God, that is Christ's second coming to us. Dr. Robert R. Kopp says he will never forget his second-born son explanation of the sacrament of Holy Communion. David wanted to receive the sacrament, but his dad thought David was too young to understand its meaning. So he asked David what happens during Holy Communion. And David answered, Jesus comes into my heart. Dr. Kopp says, I've graded denominational ordination exams and haven't heard anything any better. As we take the bread and wine into our mouths, we again take Jesus into our hearts, and we prepare ourselves for that day when we will stand or kneel in God's presence. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead once told talking with a member of his church about the meaning of communion, and the man replied to his distinguished pastor, Oh, I cannot follow all that goes on. I just sit and think quietly about Jesus. I think of that last week with his friends and the Last Supper and how he knelt in agony in Gethsemane, and how they arrested him and all night tortured him, and how he died. I get very near to Jesus then, sir, and when I go home, he comes with me. That is what we pray happens for each of us this evening. That as we leave this place, having remembered his importance in our lives, and having repented of our sins, and having prepared ourselves for his coming, as we go home, Christ goes with us. Amen. always such a hurry. <laughs> We're gathered as disciples, and tonight Jesus reveals himself to us. He is the master teacher who unexpectedly washes our feet as would a servant. He has led us triumphantly into Jerusalem, and yet he speaks of going where we cannot go, of being broken and poured out for us. We remember him now as he asked us to do in a communal meal. Whether bewildered that he must depart, sobered before the cross that awaits, or quietly anticipating Sunday's joy. Let us center ourselves now in this moment, connected with those around us, to seek God's patience, to seek God's presence in the breaking of the bread. On the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And after blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he, he poured it told us that it was poured out for all of our sins, and it's a new covenant in his blood. So as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we do this in remembrance of him.
Broken for us. Take and eat. Because of Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection, this becomes our cup of blessing. Take and drink all of it. Let us join together in the prayer of thanksgiving. Holy God, on this night, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment to love one another as he loved them. Write this commandment on our hearts as we pray, and strengthen us in service, in unity, and in love through Jesus Christ, our Lord and friend.
me in the prayer of dedication. We offer these gifts of God with joy and thanks. May they strengthen our church for acts of love and service. In Jesus' name, amen. God so loved.